right, well, let's get started and people can continue to join us um, as we go along. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, next in our virtual gardening series. Um, we're here tonight for Small Trees for the Urban Landscape um, with Richard Bernier. My name is April. I'm the Adult Services Librarian at our Souk Ranch. Um, our regular host Darby couldn't be here tonight, um, so you're uh, stuck with me tonight. Before I begin, um, I would just like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Souk First Nation. And um, please have a think about uh, whose traditional territories you're joining from, um, since we're all in different places. Um, you can put that into a chat if you feel like it. Um, I want to extend our thanks again to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with us um, to present these great programs, mm -hmm. um, especially Joanne Canning, who's here joining us tonight. Um, she took a key role in creating this whole program, and also to Richard, who's also here tonight, um, who's coordinating the programs this year. Um, so just a couple housekeeping items. Um, reminder that we are recording the session, so you'll be able to access it um, after the fact if you want to look back at it. Um, but no one's image or personal information is um, captured, and neither is um, any of the chat. Um, so speaking of the chat, um, that feature is enabled, so you can use that um, throughout. If you have questions specifically uh, for Richard, you can use the Q&A box, um, which is also at the bottom of the menu there. Um, using that just helps us keep better track of um, the questions that we specifically want to ask to Richard, so you can make use of that. Okay, um, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker tonight, um, Richard Bernier. Richard's gardening hobby started when he was a preteen, uh, when one of his elderly neighbours hired him um, for his first job to help them in their garden. They showed him what plants were weeds and directed him to a vegetable garden that was in dire need of weeding. He gardened on and off until his teens when he discovered indoor plants. So started his journey in plant husbandry and the gardening bug had bitten him. After moving to the coast in 1994, he became enamored with the climate and developed a taste for exotic plants, both indoor and outdoor. Um, so welcome Richard and thank you for being here. Thank you, April. Um, I guess I'll start sharing my screen immediately and start my presentation. Alrighty, so uh, this is a presentation on small trees for the urban landscape. Uh, let me just get through a few things first. This is presented by myself, a certified master gardener, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. It's affiliated with the Master Gardeners of BC and in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Uh, this seminar is property of the Vancouver, Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. It is intended for educational purposes. Commercial use of all or part of this seminar or its contents is prohibited without express written consent from Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and Vancouver Island Regional Library. The information is and the seminar is science-based and is accurate to the best of Binga's knowledge. Use of this information uh, seminar is sole discretion and responsibility and liability of the user. Vancouver Island, Regio, uh, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association is a chapter of the Master Gardeners Association of BC, which is part of an international organization of specially trained volunteer teachers who work in partnership with public sector agencies and private enterprise to teach, promote science-based and sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. So the urban landscape has changed in the last few years with uh, today's small potion sized lots. It has become important to know the mature size and habits of these trees. Before purchasing the tree, garden trees, you should do a garden plan noting your garden's environment, 
great care and research is needed to correctly choose your garden's green bones. Doing this will give color year-round interest and will reduce your yearly maintenance. Many newer cultivars have been bred for smaller dwarf or more fasticate stature. Fruit trees on dwarfing rootstocks have been available for many years, which also provide us with an edible bounty. This lecture will give you a starting point. The choices are unlimited. Okay, according to the renowned British garden designer, David Domeni, a shrub is identified as a woolly, woody plant that is smaller than a tree and generally has a rounded shape. The main difference between the two is that a shrub has main stem growing from the ground level rather, rather than one trunk. Now, this is a matter of personal definition, I guess, because you can have a small, a large shrub that you can train into a small tree. Okay, the basics of tree selection. Making a landscape uh, focal point. Now with this, you wanna create a certain focal point in your yard, whether or not it's evergreen or a deciduous tree, uh, it adds to the, um, to the looks of your home, uh, making it more, uh, I guess, presentable in a way. Uh, providing summer shade and winter brightness. Now with this, you can uh, present, you can shade the, the house from the sun, which will lower your heating costs or cooling costs in the summer and increase, uh, decrease your heating costs in the winter time. It's also to do with brightness. Uh, providing year round privacy and security. Now with these small lots, we have, uh, not much distance between the road and our houses. So if you want security, you want privacy, plant some trees and shrubs around it and you will be, will create, create a, a private little area for yourself. Making a windbreak and defining property lines. Now a windbreak is particularly important. Uh, it reduces the amount of um, evaporation in the summer and reduces the, uh, the wind effect on your home in the winter time. So in other words, uh, your house is more insulated against the, uh, the wind. Growing edibles, and we all like edibles. So what am I talking about edibles? I'm talking about peaches, pears, cherries, or any other uh, fruit tree that can be grafted onto a, a dwarfing rootstock. Creating wildlife habitat. That's particularly important in our cities. Uh, we have so much concrete in our cities nowadays that the wildlife cannot really survive. So if you have trees and shrubs, you, you invite the wildlife into your yard and that birds, uh, that's squirrels, all manner of things. Okay, the basics of tree selection. Okay, uh, basically when you're looking for a tree, you're looking for climate zone. Now, if you don't buy a tree that's a hardy in your climate, then why bother? It's not gonna work. So if you live in a zone three and you're trying to grow something that's zone six, zone seven, there's just no way it's gonna work in your yard. You can push the envelope slightly by creating a microclimate in your yard but that would only give you maybe one zone of uh, reprieve. Site plan. Site plan is really important too. Uh, this has to do with uh, how much space you have 
whether or not uh, there's hydro, hydro lines, telecom utilities, uh, underground utilities, that could be water lines, that could be gas lines, it could be the sewage lines. The environment. Now, this is kind of important too. Uh, do you have a lot of sun in your yard? A lot of shade? What is the aspect? Does it face south? Does it face north? Does it face west? What is your soil? Which is a very important. Uh, if you try to plant some plants in a very boggy condition, not all trees will do well in that. Uh, soil moisture. If you're live, if you gardening on a, a sandy uh, spot, well, you're going to end up doing a lot of watering or a lot of amending of the soil. Uh, microclimate. Now, microclimate. Uh, if you have a small corner that faces south, southwest, that becomes a nice little microclimate, and you may be able to grow things one climate zone above your above you. Mature size, that's an important aspect also. Uh, we're not only talking about height, but we're also talking about width of it. So if you only have a 20 foot front yard from the front of the house to the house itself, and you plant something that's gonna grow 40 feet wide, well, guess what? You're gonna create a lot of work for yourself. You're gonna be, uh, pruning and trimming the plant, the tree all the time. And I think in today's society with two people working, not a lot of people want to come home and have to deal with uh, something like that. Leaf size and color. Now, leaf size would be whether it's a small leaf, a large leaf, uh, the color of it, uh, let's say if you have a deep blue house and you put something up against it that's maybe a golden color, it makes a really nice statement. Pest and diseases. Okay, well, Joe and I were just talking a few minutes ago about uh, spruce budworm and uh, the pine beetle. As our climate gets warmer, we will see a lot of these pests. So you wanna choose a tree or a large shrub tree uh, and make sure it doesn't harbor pests or diseases or isn't prone to those. Climate change, now that's a big issue nowadays. And generally speaking uh, on the island, and I don't know if all of you are from Vancouver Island, but, uh, we have seen definitely a lot of changes in our climate. We're seeing uh, more prolonged drought, bigger storms in the winter time. So you have to keep that in mind too. If you want to plant a willow in a sandy soil, you'll be watering all the time. Thus, choose a tree that has deep roots and uh, can get to whatever water is still in the ground. Watering restrictions. A lot of our island, um, a lot of our island uh, cities and towns have strict watering restrictions, so that some of them will not even allow you to water during a drought. The other thing is civil uh, civic restrictions. Uh, I don't know if you really call them restrictions. I think more than anything, they call them. Um, what am I trying to say here? Uh, suggestions. So again, you wouldn't want to plant a tree that grows 60 meters or 60 feet under a hydro line because guess what? Hydro is going to have to come by and keep trimming it and you lose the actual uh, appearance of the tree. It becomes something that is bizarre looking. I don't know if any of you have seen any of the trees on the island where there's hydro lines going through and there's a tall tree. Well, you get a tree with a U section taken out of it so that uh, it's not a danger to the hydro lines. Basic tree selection. 
Okay, so now we're talking about looking at the tree at the nursery. You don't want to pick something that is misshapen or uh, shabby looking or beat up. So in other words, by beat up, uh, some of the branches are broken off of it. Uh, it's just poor looking. It has no, it just not suit. Uh, no signs of water deficiency as brown, curly leaves or needles. This means the tree has already been placed in uh, an area where, um, not an area, a health condition that will make it more prone to disease and, and insects. So you wanna choose a tree that has healthy leaves, not brown, not curly, and that the needles are intact on the tree. Little no scarring on the trunk or uh, branch wood. So in other words, you don't wanna see big scars on it. Let's say if the tree was tied to uh, a pole in the nursery or um, to keep it standing upright, you don't wanna see any mars in the bark where the bark has been rubbed away. And the same thing with the branches because any of these will invite pests and diseases into the wood itself. Absence of blotching or holes on the leaves, this would indicate insects. And you do not want to bring an insect into your yard if you don't have it to begin with. Now, some insects are particularly uh, peculiar to certain trees, but some are, are not. And we'll go over just, uh, go after just about any tree. Uniform bark, not wounded or blemished. Minimal dead branches and twigs. Well-developed top leader, vertical stem, vertical stem that's located at the trunk of the tent, uh, top of the trunk. In other words, you don't want a split in the leader. You don't want two leaders. This creates, uh, can create some issues later on. Single leader, again, avoid multiple leaders and trunks. Trunks that taper uniformly. In other words, from the base to the top is a uniform uh, taper. So from the trunk it goes and tapers up to the top. Well distributed branches spaced between eight and 12 inches apart. And that kind of makes sense. You don't want all the branches on one side, you'd sort of like them to be all around the tree, uh, which is a good idea. It's visually more pleasing and it leads to a healthier, stronger tree. Wide angles of the crotch between trunk and branches. Now I was talking about uh, well-developed top leader, single top leader. And the reason why is some trees, uh, if they have um, two leaders, it becomes a narrow crotch. And in that crotch, it is more prone to breaking. So what you want is just a single leader. If you buy a tree and you see two leaders, cut one of the leaders out. Choose it. Choose the best of the two. Cut the one that you want to cut out and make it as a single leader. It will... Uh, result in a lot less issues in the future, and uh, you won't have uh, breakage. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but a uh, two-liter tree, one of the leaders breaks off, you have a gaping wound on it, and it invites uh, insect damage, diseases, you name it. And the tree looks doesn't look good at all because of it. Evenly rotated branches around the trunk, and that's pretty well self-explanatory. Okay, so now you're looking at uh, the tree, the roots, and everything else. Now, root ball dimensions. What you want is a root ball that is in proportion to the top of the tree. In other words, you don't want a 15-foot tree with a two-foot or uh, let's say a foot uh, root 
it's just not going to be able to provide all the uh, basic nutrients and the water that the tree needs. Now, I must say there are some trees that are very uh, shallow rooted and very fibrous rooted, such as rhododendrons, where you can get away with a smaller root ball, but still have a fairly substantial crown on it. Rooted uh, root collar and flare. Now the root collar is where the roots and the trunk join. You wanna make sure that it's in good shape. Circling roots. Now circling roots, when you, you I would suggest, and I don't know how comfortable people feel with this, is to take the tree, smack it a few times on the ground, uh, the pot, pull the pot, uh, the tree out of the pot and look, if you find a lot of circling roots in it, chances are it's pot bound and should have been potted up a while ago. And those roots will keep circling around the tree and will not spread out. You can tease the roots out, but only to a certain degree. Uh, some people will use a knife and cut into the roots, which does work. It will get the roots to flare out a certain, a certain amount. Stem girdling roots. Now these are roots that actually wrap around and very close to the stem itself. These roots grow as much as the, the, uh, the uh, trunk of the tree. And as the root grows, the tree grows, and um, it creates, uh, what it does, it blocks the nutrients from going up to the tree canopy. Root bound trees, and again, that's pretty well self-explanatory. It means that the, uh, the uh, nursery really hasn't done their due diligence and haven't been uh, really taking care of their nursery stock. Okay, now we come to planting. Dig a hole about twice the size and the depth of the root ball. Now, the reason why we're doing this is to provide good soil for the root ball to get it through the first year or two. It provides a nice soil uh, for the roots to extend into. Remember to check the roots and if it's root uh, pot down, loosen the roots and tease them out, which is what I was talking about earlier. Plant at the same, uh, same height as it was in the pot. Now for this, what you wanna do is keep the soil away from the, uh, the root trunk collar. And the reason for this, if you bury the trunk on the tree, you're inviting rot into the bark, you're inviting uh, insect damage, you're inviting any kind of disease, soil-borne disease into the tree itself. Backfill with amended soil with compost and red, well-rotted manure. Now, compost and red, uh, red well-rotted manure will provide the tree with a very uh, porous, very moisture retentive, very rich in uh, micronutrients, and uh, it gives the tree that boost it needs to be able to uh, survive in the soil. Water it in. Very good idea. You're not going to just put this tree in this in the ground, put the compost and just leave it there. No, water it in very well. Uh, sometimes it's a good idea to uh, sort of uh, berm up the soil in a circle around the tree so that the water will go to the roots and not flow out. Remember to water deeply at least once a week for the first season. Now, again, it's pretty well self-explanatory. You wanna make sure that the soil is nice and moist and being it's its first season, the first season is when it may not put out a lot of vegetative growth, but that's the time when it's putting out all those roots. So keep it well watered. And I think there's an adage that's sleep, leap, no sleep, creep and leap. 
The first year it sleeps the tree. The second year it creeps along. So you may get a little bit more foliage on it. The third year, all heck takes happens. Basically, you end up with a lovely tree. Best time to plant is in the spring and fall. Now, this is on the on the island. Other places, it's probably best to uh, plant in the spring. Uh, the reason for that is because it will give the tree a good season to shoot out those roots and provide it with uh, enough moisture where it won't dry out in the wintertime. Uh, fall on the island, we can plant them too because fall is our raining season. Uh, and well, um, this year it hasn't been very wet in the spring. We had a very dry season this year. Uh, tree selections. Now, evergreens. Now you can get a broadleaf or a needle evergreen. Broadleafs would be uh, rhododendrons. They would be uh, pyrus. They would be uh, broadleaf magnolias. Some of the magnolias are evergreen. Needles, of course, that would be spruce, pine. Uh, any of those use. Now deciduous, you've got broadleaf or needle also. So broadleaf deciduous, we all know those. That's the uh, maples, oaks, beech. Uh, needles, that would be the larch that uh, grows quite, quite a bit here in the prairies where I am right at the moment. I'm just visiting my mother in Edmonton. Now fruit trees, and uh, again, they would be all deciduous, but uh, can provide you with a, a nice edible bounty. Okay, let's go to evergreens. Now rhododendrons, I don't know if any of you knew, but there are rhododendrons that grow into trees and they're quite lovely. They provide you with year round interest. They have, uh, some of them have lovely leaves with a, a fawn shaped or a, a bright red undamandum, which is the, um, the fuzz underneath the leaves. Uh, boxwood. Uh, I've, um, Irex. That is, geez, I'm losing it. <laughs> Camellias, prunus, magnolias, and mahonia. Okay, let's start on the rhododendrons. Now here's a rhododendron that I have in my yard currently. Uh, it grows into uh, a tree, uh, 10 years, it's six feet tall. It's hardy to minus 23 Celsius. It has a lovely fragrant flower. Leaves are quite large, up to seven inches long. And beautiful, very fragrant flowers. Let's go back. So how do I go back on this? Okay, uh, here's a rhododendron. Uh, Lodori Venus, it's another one that grows into a tree. At 10 years, at six feet. Uh, it's good to minus 18 uh, Celsius. Fragrant flowers, uh, nine to 12 fl uh, flowers per uh, cluster, five and a half inches across and fragrant pink in color. Okay, boxwood. This is the um, holly, holly. Camellias. Prunus. Uh, this is the Portuguese laurel. And it can be trained as a single trunked tree. Normally you would see it as a large shrub. 
uh, Magnolia grandiflora. This is K. Paris, beautiful flowers on it. I will go into further uh, detail on these uh, a little later in the slideshow. Mahonia charity, wonderful uh, evergreen uh, plant grows up to 20, uh, probably about four or five meters high. Uh, evergreen provides a lovely yellow flower that is fragrant. And uh, this will invite a lot of hummingbirds into your yard. The hummingbirds love it. They use it as um, a nectar source, nectar source during the winter time. I had one at the old house just outside my kitchen window, and it was ever so nice in January, February to see these flowers and see these hummingbirds rushing about trying to uh, protect their, uh, their area. Tracheocarpus fortunii. Now this is an evergreen palm that's hardy on the island. Beautiful. Um, it's fully hardy anywhere on the island. Uh, grows into quite a large uh, plant, about 20 to 30 feet high, but does not take up a lot of ground space, right? And this is another thing that you can do. You can underplant these with other trees, other shrubs or whatever and create a very tropical look. Evergreen coniferous, there's pines, spruce, um, what, uh, Texas is, Joe, what is Texas? <laughs> I'm losing it. Texas, sequoia, uh, very large tree. Uh, there are some that are very, uh, form a pillar almost, uh, it's quite fast to gate. Okay, these are the pines. Oops, two pines. Okay, Pinus strobus. No. Let me just go through my notes here. Okay. Pinostropus fastigate. It's a uh, scotch pine, needle evergreen. Uh, it's an Eastern white pine. Uh, it's hardy to zone uh, zone three to eight. It grows 30 to 40 feet tall and remains seven to 10 feet wide at the bottom, which is ideal for a uh, small garden. It's evergreen, it's showy, uh, it's tolerant to rabbit and deer, uh, requires minimum water, and it's very low maintenance. Uh, winter interest on it. There are some that actually have more of a, a yellow sort of color to the leaves. Now the Pinus silvestri, that is uh, another tree that actually grows uh, quite fast to gate. It's hardy zone three to seven, height of 20 meters. Uh, 20 feet, sorry, 25, 20 to 25, and it only spreads six to eight feet wide. Okay, and these are the spruce. Now, this one I have myself in the yard. It's uh, Montero's Charm, and it's a narrow growing evergreen spruce. It's hardy. Uh, to zone right to zone three. The height uh, height is about four to five meters, spreads about a meter to a meter and a quarter wide, a very narrow, dense conical uh, conifer. 
needles on very vertical branches are blue all year round. So this will give you a little bit of winter color. Uh, this specimen uh, is great in confined spaces. And this is the Iseli uh, Fastigate. It's uh, the Colorado Spruce. And it is narrow columnar again, uh, upright, very dense branching, short, fuzzy, light green needles, softer than Mount Rose Fire, fast growing with a perfect form. It's hardy to zone three and eight to 10 meters tall and two to three meters wide at the base. Now, this would be uh, the Texas uh, Bocata Fastigate Aura. Now, it grows 10 to 20 centimeters a year. Maintenance very low, winter, winter hardiness, very hardy. Growth weight uh, once a year, grows only in the spring. Uh, position, shade, parcel shade, sun, so it's pretty well good in all kinds of light other than up against the house on the north side. Uh, it's uh, commonly called an Irish yew or venom tree. It's a uh, columnar yew with red berries. Uh, the berries on it are, they say, are supposed to be poisonous. It's medium size evergreen conifer with shiny yellow needles, very soft, blooms in March and April, and then green, gets green flowers. Sequoia dendron giganteum. Now, this is the Sequoia dendron giganteum pendulatum. Now, again, it's fairly narrow, uh, beautiful conifer. Uh, the only thing on this tree that can happen, it can get multiple leaders on the top and will actually sometimes bend towards the ground. So if you can see this one, uh, eventually that will go off like this and may actually, uh, I wouldn't plant that close to a street. I would try to plant this so that this goes, um, where there is nothing else that, let's say, it'll bother uh, whether or not it's power lines or whatever, or grows into your neighbor's yard. Its ultimate height is about 40 feet, and it's hardy to, uh, from zone six onward. Now we have deciduous. Quakerus, which is the oak, Acer, which are the maples, Aegis, which are the beech, magnolias, hibiscus. Yeah, there is a hibiscus that can grow into a tree shape. Elms, dogwood or cornice and larks or larch. Okay, these are some of the columnar uh, oaks. There's a uh, Quicris palustris uh, pringreen. It's a uh, lacy sort of pyramidal when young matures to more of a novelesque uh, form. Newt branches uh, lower are pendulous uh, middle branches stretch horizontally and topmost branches arch upward. It's a real focal point. Uh, zone five um, height can be up to 16 meters and spread 13 meters. So again, this is one that you would have to definitely place in uh, a corner somewhere where you would have the room. The reason for that is again, you want to make sure that you don't Plant it where it's going to rub it up against the house or telephone poles or anything like this. Uh, oak, crimson, uh, 
spire. I had this one in my last yard, beautiful tree, lovely. It had the loveliest red uh, sort of um, almost a rusty colored leaf in the winter time. And um, a nice thing to it, it kept the leaves on all winter time. So you had that color all year round. I, in the summer, it was green and then went red and then became almost like a, a rusty tan color through the winter. It's a good to zone five height, uh, 15 meters, spread is five meters, and it's columnar, uh, full sun, dark green foliage, and rusty red in the fall. Acers. Now these are the Japanese maples. Uh, a lot of the Japanese maples are considered small trees. You can see this one is more in a shrub shape, but this could have been pruned into more of a tree shape by removing some of these lower branches. This one in particular has that reddish color all uh, from the spring right through to fall. In the fall, it goes a beautiful scarlet color. It's a beautiful tree. Uh, it does require in some uh, zones requires wind and winter protection. It is barely hardy in Ottawa, but with proper care will add um, a gorgeous addition to your patio or entrance. Borderline hardy, hardy to zone six, uh, to zone five. Height is two meters, spread about five meters. Uh, rounded upright, uh, sun to part shade, foliage is deep red, and it does have fruit. It's uh, the common like winged fruit. Uh, Crimson century maple. This is the, uh, the crimson maple, the Norway maple, and fret not, it does not provide, it does not go to seed. It's one of those sterile, uh, maples. And again, lovely color in the spring. In the fall, it goes kind of like uh, more of a purpley uh, red. Beautiful colors. Um, zone four. Uh, height of eight meters, spread of five meters. Uh, oval, upright, sun, deep purple, maroon to reddish bronze in the fall. And uh, yeah, now we have the sugar maple temple. This is one of the sugar maples, uh, pyramidal shape. Uh, temple sugar is an excellent choice for those looking to add height to the landscape without too much width. Zone far four, it's high from uh, height, sorry, uh, 23 to 25 meters, uh, only three to five meters wide. Pyramidal will take uh, sun or shade, uh, part shade, sorry. Uh, foliage is green and it's a red orange in the winter time. Beautiful specimen. Now here's some of the beech trees. Again, there are some that are fast gate. This is a, a beech tricolor. It's lovely colors. It's got uh, the green, the cream color, and the red to it. Ideal specimen for a smaller landscape garden. Cultivar is known for its crinkly, wavy foliage. Little pruning necessary to remain it, to maintain its shape. Thrives in a rich, moist, well-drained soil. So again, this is perhaps not a tree to grow if you have a lot of sand. But in an area, let's say if you're close to a river or close to some sort of stream uh, or have a wet sort of area, not overly wet, but damp, this would be a, a great addition. Zone four, uh, 10 to 12 meters high and three to four meters wide. Columnar, up, uh, compact, full sun or partial shade. Color is purple and coppery bronze in the winter or in the fall. Okay, now we're on to the magnolias, magnolia royal 
star. This is the star Magnolia, beautiful small tree, or can be maintained as a small shrub, lovely uh, fragrant flowers double. It's zone, a hardy to zone five, um, height of five meters, spread of about three meters, rounded, sun to part shade, dark green foliage, foliage. Uh, fall color is bronze, flower color is pure white, beautiful tree in the spring, colored, uh, the flowers are uh, very fragrant, and they're large and double. Now, this one is another tree that I had in my yard, uh, Magnolia Virginiana Moonglow. Uh, this is one that is actually from the States. And again, beautiful tree. Uh, okay. Um, okay, it's hardy to zone five. Um, height, five meters, spread three to three to five meters. It's rounded in shape, sun part shade, uh, dark green foliage, bronze underneath the leaves and uh, flower is creamy white. Again, it's got a very lovely citrusy sort of smell. Beautiful tree uh, is um, evergreen on the island, but anywhere, let's say zone six and down, it would probably be classified as a deciduous tree. Okay, these are hibiscus. Now, hibiscus syrianus, uh, there's multiple cultivars. Again, these are small trees, large shrubs. They can be pruned into a single uh, stem. Uh, Pink Chabon is a very lovely flower. It's a double flower, late flowering and late to come out to leaf. It's uh, borderline hardy in zone five. Height is probably higher than this. Uh, they say about two and a half to four meters. Spread is about a meter to two meters. Upright, woody, uh, woody um, full sun, green, and the flower is pink. And if you can see, there's bluebird, which I have in the yard also. This is an older cultivar, and this is a brand new cultivar that was released not too long ago. Now, almost elm trees. Now, I understand there is a lot of uh, trepidation about planting elms because of the elm tree, elm tree uh, bark borer. Uh, these are two particular ones which are uh, not as susceptible as the American elm. There's almost part cardivolia and uh, the elm camperdown. Camperdown is a, uh, it's a grafted tree. The branches extend from the top uh, downwards. Gives kind of an umbrella sort of a shape. It's hardy to zone four. Height six meters, spread four meters, but that can be kept smaller. It's weeping, uh, likes full sun, foliage is green, and again, it has a lovely fall color of bronze. Uh, the almost part folia is, uh, it's a Chinese elm cultivar. It was raised uh, by John Barber in Georgia. The Everclear is distinguished by its fascicate form growing 10 meters by, 30, uh, which is 33 feet by two meters wide. So it has larger leaves, darker than the apparent disease uh, and pest and disease. It's uh, species and its cultivar is highly resistant, not immune to Dutch elm disease and completely unaffected by elm leaf beater, uh, beetle. Damage caused by Japanese beetle is relatively slight. 
Cultivar is reputed to be fast growing in well-drained soil. Tree has been selected for inclusion to the National Elm Trial coordinated by Colorado, Colorado State University. My favorites, dogwoods. Now this is uh, Cornus Cusa, which is the uh, Chinese uh, dogwood. And uh, this particular one is Milky Way on, the, on your left. It uh, grows spherical fruit resembling raspberries that are held singly in the fall, drooping dark leaves, fall color. Another one, this has got a lot of fall color to it. It's uh, dark scarlet to red purple, broad, broad. Bushy form, bloom, uh, blooming time, late spring, zone five, and its uh, height is six to seven meters and spread six to seven meters. Uh, masses of pink, uh, no, the Cornus Cusa Milky Way has white flowers. It's quite floriferous. What I found is it has so much flowers on it that if it gets wet in the summer, the branches droop quite substantially. Uh, there are other cornus that you could uh, plant, or cornus crucis that you could plant. This one has probably got about the most nice shape of them. And the old yard, I had um, a red variety. It was cornus crusa. I can't remember. Anyway. Uh, okay, and cornus florida. Uh, florida. Cherokee Brave. Now, it is the fall color of scarlet red, almost pink, uh, upright clumped with tiered horizontal branches, springtime again in the spring. Zone six, flowers are red, deep pink, uh, grows to seven to eight meters and spread seven to eight meters. Now, these are mature, uh, sizes. Uh, to get a mature size in these, you're looking at uh, probably 30 years. So they can be very easily controlled to uh, a smaller space. On our new property, we have an old uh, dogwood tree, and it's probably about 25 feet tall, has been there for 40 some years and is not very wide. It's probably maybe 10 feet wide at the most. Uh, larch. Now, uh, there's a couple of different larch. Now, these are trees that actually lose their leaves. They're a uh, coniferous tree that loses their leaves in the winter time. Uh, this particular one, blue rabbit, uh, mature height, 15 to 20 feet. Uh, autumn color, it's, you could do it into a bonsai. It's columnar. Deer resistant, has really interesting foliage because it does go sort of a, a yellow gold in this uh, fall. Uh, hardy to zone four. Sun to part shade. Water needs are minimum. And leaf retention, no, it's deciduous. The other one, uh, Jacobson's Pyramid, hardiness uh, to zone four, upright columnar growth, fall color is colored to red, almost a pink color, upright clump, clump with tiered horizontal branches, bloom time is in the spring, uh, zone six, uh, color red, pink. Now this would form uh, like a, a, a um, sorry, <laughs> it's very hot in here. I'm having a difficult time. It must be the gray hair or something. Anyway, uh, it grows seven to eight meters and seven to eight meters wide. Average size, it's, uh, yeah, full sun, requires full sun. Okay, 
fir trees. Malus domestica, that is the apple. Prunus, cherries. And pears, Pyrus communis. Okay, so we have a uh, very spire apple tree. Now this is one that's quite hardy in the prairies. It's hardy on the island two hardiness zone from three to nine. Uh, Self-pollinating, no. So you would need to have another uh, apple tree of a different variety to pollinate it. Mature height, 10 to 15 feet, width, 8 to 12 feet. Uh, late summer through fall is the harvest season. Uh, if you're planting them in a, as a, a windbreak for the summer, 8 to 20 feet, they say. Uh, okay, best seasons to plant would be the fall through the spring for us on the island. And... For zone two to six would be the spring. Optimum soil would be a neutral soil, so nothing too acid or too, uh, too um, alkali. Fragrance is mild. Uh, crude color, red over a yellow russet. Sweet and slightly tart. Fresh is white. The Scarlet Sentinel. Now this is quite a, a new tree on the market. It's been available probably for about maybe 15 years or so. Uh, they grow quite columnar. Uh, mature height is um, 10 to 15 feet. And they only grow about maybe, at most, maybe four feet wide. Uh, the fruiting spurs grow directly off the main, uh, main trunk. And uh, again, a beautiful plant. You do need two of them in the yard, so two different of the uh, sentinel varieties. And we'll provide you with an abundance of fruit. Now, again, you have to remember that apples are biennial uh, fruiting. I have tried by uh, removing some of the fruit in the tree and leaving one per fruiting or flowering uh, spot. And even that didn't help. They still only flowered every two years. So what I've done in uh, what I'm doing in my new garden is I'm going to get two. I'm gonna put one in one year and the second one in the next year. And hopefully that will uh, one of the trees will be fruiting every year for me. Now, it's a very small, uh, columnar tree. I had one in a space right next to my greenhouse. Uh, it was only about two feet from the greenhouse and about on either side of the door. And a uh, lovely tree. Uh, you do have to watch, though. It is susceptible to... Uh, some of the um, bark diseases. So uh, cleaning the tree, making sure you take all the leaves off and um, any um, remaining fruit in the tree, make sure you take it, clean off the soil around the bottom of the tree in the fall. Now we're coming to uh, the cherries. Now, both of these cherries are new on the market in the last five years. They are uh, deciduous cherry. They're hardy from uh, probably zone, zone 2A. So these are quite rapidly growing. Um, they grow to a height of about seven feet, six feet wide. Uh, Required normal um, moisture, light, uh, full sun, uh, fall color is orange, uh, berries are dark red. Uh, the fruit's about five grams, and uh, they do have, um, I don't know if anybody understands this, but a uh, bricks sugar content is 22. So it's not a sweet, sweet cherry, it's more of a sweet 
uh, sour cherry. And like I said, it's in it's hearty on the uh, to zone two A. Beautiful little tree. Uh, now there is some question as to whether or not it needs a pollinator. Uh, if you have other trees in the neighborhood, probably not. But if you've got this tree growing by itself, I might suggest you put another uh, tree, another uh, same type, um, either get a Romeo Anna Juliet or uh, some other cherries in the yard. Uh, harvest early to mid-August, flowers are right. Now they say medium growth rate. On the island, I found it really grew quite quick. Uh, I bought one as maybe uh, about that large. It was about six inches large at uh, our neighborhood uh, home hardware. And now I've had to repot it. I bought it maybe two or three years ago and it's already about maybe uh, four and a half feet tall. It's easily pruned so that you can keep it fairly narrow. And like I said, it doesn't grow into a large, enormous tree. Uh, let's see. Okay. Now we're going to pears. Uh, two pears in uh, particular, Pyrus communis, Summer Crisp, and Pyrus communis Williams. Both those trees are hardy to zone four, minimum temperature of uh, minus 35 Celsius. Self-pollinating, yes, so all you need is one of them in the yard. Uh, mature height, 10 to 15 feet, and width, 8 to 12 feet. Now, again, that can be kept fairly narrow with minimum pruning. Uh, harvest season, summer through fall, uh, best season to plant uh, zone seven to 11, fall through spring, uh, zone uh, two to six in the spring. Loves a neutral soil, uh, blossoms are fragrant. Uh, fruit color is a sunshine yellow, green, crimson blush. Juicy, very sweet, more crisp than most pears. So I would say it's probably more like uh, an apple pear or a Chinese pear, as far as the texture is. Uh, now, the other one is this Williams. It's uh, Bartlett, basically. Um, beautiful tree, uh, hardiness to uh, zone five to nine, so minus 35 Celsius. Now, Minus 35 Celsius is borderline for it. So again, it would have to be in a protected spite, uh, spot. Um, mature height, 10 to 15 feet. Mature width, eight to 12 feet. Uh, in zone seven to 11, fall through spring is the best time to plant. And that would be in our zones on the island. And uh, zone two to six in the spring. Loves uh, neutral soil, uh, fragrant flowers, and uh, fruit color is yellow green with pink blush and uh, sweet buttery uh, flesh. Okay, so my references are Encyclopedia to Garden Plants, Sunset, uh, Western Gardeners, 400 Trees and Shrubs for Small Spaces by Diane Miller. Durr's Encyclopedia of Trees and Shrubs by Michael Durr. Fruit Trees for a Small Space, Abundant Harvest from Your Own Backyard by Colby Eckerman. And thank you very much for listening me talk on about some of my favorite trees. Get out of this. Thank you very much, Richard. That was great. So don't forget, if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A here also. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Richard. That was really, uh, really enlightening and really covered all the bases. Some lively chat happening as well. And uh, one of the things that uh, we all uh, noticed was um, the changing philosophy on how much to fertilize new trees. And uh, so your comments on um, adding enough to feed them and um, being really careful about um, the roots and what the genus needs was, uh, was really valuable. Um, uh, I tried to give a few people um, some ideas. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, drought tolerant and fire smart uh, trees, of course. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of the drought tolerant trees are, in fact, fire smart. Um, yeah. And uh, so it, it was nice that you uh, included those as well. Um, I know that um, uh, Washington and Oregon State Extension Services have very good um, links for both those types of trees for the uh, home garden. Um, can you think of any other links that, uh, aside maybe from um, uh, Minter Gardens uh, or you? Uh, Minter Gardens is very good. Uh, you can also go to uh, UBC has a good site also, their gardens. Uh, any of the big garden, um, big gardens, landscape gardens are a good place to look at these trees. The only thing else I wanted to add to uh, amending the soil. Now there is a lot of discussion around using uh, bone meal uh, to actually put in the soil while you're planting trees. Now, I don't know if anybody really understands this, that phosphorus is not readily available to the tree. So you could put as much uh, bone meal in there and it's not really gonna help. It actually is not water soluble. It takes years to move anywhere in the soil strata. So, um, it was used many years ago, but not so much anymore. Uh, phosphorus isn't, but phosphate is water soluble. So if you're using, you're planting a tree, then use maybe, uh, apart from using the mature, uh, the, um, the manure and the bark mulch, uh, add some slow release granular fertilizer to it. And it has a phosphate in it, which is actually readily available to the roots. Thank you. Um, we also have a couple of questions. Um, now, someone said, uh, talked about planting the polonia, the uh, empress tree, um, which I've read is quite a thug. They're glorious oh. and big. Um, and the uh, uh, and Ellen is concerned about it uh, getting down into her well, and uh, and my Very. my knowledge is, don't plant the darn thing. It will eat your well. It's, it will uh, eat your well. Also, uh, it's a beautiful tree, but in a large area. Remember, I was saying watch your underground utilities. So that would be your sewage, your water line, your gas line, telephone, hydro, and all of these other things. So you don't want to plant something that may infiltrate your sewage or anything like that, or actually interfere with uh, any of your underground utilities. So it's probably not a, a good idea to plant that. Uh, there are so many other trees and shrubs that are not as uh, invasive. Also, a good place to start is talk to your community. Talk to City Hall. They most times will have a list of trees that they recommend on small lots, or they recommend planting under hydro lines. Uh, BC Hydro has a website, and in that website, they tell you the approximate height of mature trees, and they will tell you how close you can plant to the hydro lines. Now, again, that comes to talking to uh, the, the city or town you live in and making sure you know where everything is in the ground, right? Just, uh, 
having to put a new sewer to your house is not fun. Very <laughs> expensive. Very expensive. And you don't want to go there. That's that's a very that's a very good point. Having had us uh, inherited an old house and old trees that ate the sewer line, um, I I really hear you, um, and that really dovetails into Deborah's question um, about uh, trees grown near houses, and uh, your your comments on know what the roots want to do, know how thirsty the tree is, and how big it will be. And I, I, can't, uh, I can't tell uh, you the number of times that I've talked to clients and they've said, oh, but the tag said that it will only be 10 feet in 15 years. And, and my reply is yes, and that tree lives 150 years. So what you got is a teenager and it's gonna grow <laughs> huge. And- uh, can and, be a fun. and also in our mild climates, I mean, uh, we have some lovely folks from California and Australia and the Netherlands and um, what will grow um, 10 feet and other climates will grow three times as large. And um, all you have exactly. to do is look at the at the native pine trees and um, where um, something inland will grow 50 feet um, in the mild coastal climate, it's 150 feet, yet it's the same genus and sometimes the same species. So you that, really have to take care. That uh, that oak that I had mentioned, uh, Crimson Spire or Crimson Century, basically grows two feet a year. Wow. Yes, beautiful tree, beautiful, beautiful tree. But in our climate, it can grow uncontrollably because we have such a long uh, season. It's deep rooted, which is great. But again, that's not something you would plant right up against the house. You look at the mature width, add an extra five feet, plant it there. You know, and you can always underplant it uh, with something else, uh, create more of a, a layered look in your landscape. Um, here's one from Bonita, uh, Richard. Um, she says, uh, my baby fringe tree has dropped all its leaves. Ooh. <laughs> uh, what can I give it to help uh, to keep it from dying? Well, I, I guess we have to know. probably too late. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it dried out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, it may come back. What I would suggest you do is scratch the bark. If it's still green underneath the that top layer of bark, leave it. Leave it till next year and see if it does branch, uh, it does leaf out again. Uh, chances are it may not, but again, depending on the size, it's maybe something that you don't want to lose and you want to keep, right? So I always give it a year. And like I said, if it doesn't come back, well, pull it out and plant something else but plant something else that is one hardy in your area. Secondly, doesn't maybe require as much water and keeping that in mind. And also, like I said before, if you live in a, um, a town or a city that has wild, uh, has watering restrictions in the summer, then chances are it's maybe not a good idea. I know in Qualcomm Beach, where I live, they're suggesting that we put in cisterns, watering cisterns. So our new house will have a 3,000 gallon cistern, which I'll collect rainwater, store it in there, and then I'll have a pressure system, a drip system underground to water any of the big trees and um, rotos I have. Um, Richard, um, Jill, um wants to know um, whether you think the Pacific dogwood is good for small yards. We have a thousand and one of them uh, here in Ladysmith. And uh, even the old ones don't grow that large. They top out at uh, what, 15, 15 yeah. feet? Probably you know? higher than that. I've seen some up, uh, up island where I'm uh, currently living that are about good 20, 30 feet tall. Oh, okay. But this 
The thing about Pacific dogwood, if it's out in the open, it will be broader and not as tall. If it's in a more of a treed area, it'll be narrower and more upright. So again, you have to know where you're planting it, what you're doing with it and everything else. Pacific dogwood is very hardy in our area. It's uh, drought tolerant. And yeah, I don't know, it's very pretty tree. It will flower for you in the spring, early spring, and sometimes multiple uh, will flower again in the late summer, early fall. So beautiful tree, mind you, know where you're planting it. Know that it can get sun damage to the bark because this is a tree that grows in a forest. It doesn't grow out by itself. So you can get uh, maybe the bark splitting. If the bark splits, then you're asking for pests and diseases to enter the bark and cause problems. Um, and we have a question from Deborah about uh, deer resistance to dogwood. And we've had a couple of deer resistant questions. And I think, I think that the couple of things to remember is deer um, don't read uh, human lists. And no. <laughs> um, what, what, what um, a deer in one area may predate will be different from in another what area. They predate in another area because yeah. it depends on what else there is to eat. And deer are browsers, so they eat the least worst thing. And also, yeah, I mean, any well. young tree, any young plant um, is candy for all yeah, wild animals. Exactly. Especially so you young really, you really do need to net a young tree, don't you think, Richard? Yeah, you do need to net it. Uh, the other thing is the new tender growth in the spring doesn't have as many toxins to it and everything else. The deers will nibble at it later on in the summer. They won't because it has built up uh, the resistance to browsers and everything like that. But uh, netting them is a good idea, putting a wire cage around them. I know on the, prayer, on the, uh, on the island, we are deer, little deer. We're not very big. So uh, if you have maybe a six foot cage around it, it's fine. A uh, wire cage of some sort. Or if you've got a two meter fence around your yard, don't worry about it. But again, uh, the magnolias, are uh, the evergreen magnolias are not uh, uh, fodder for deer. They don't like the texture of the leaves. They're very uh, cardboardy-ish, so they don't like that. Uh, pine, spruce, any of those evergreens are deer resistant. Uh, of course, if you're going to plant an apple tree or a pear tree or anything like that, then you would have to definitely put it in a cage or in a backyard somewhere. Until it gets tough. Yeah. Now, someone was asking about plums. Um, and um, I know one of the problems with plums in our area is that they're very susceptible to black knot. Um, they are. But I think um, going to the your local nursery um, and asking and seeing what they have for sale and asking because people people forget that um, these people make their living by having good plants and if they're yeah. selling plants that don't survive they're not going to be in business for very long so no, to find a good reputable garden center not a big box store we're talking no, about garden no. center don't exactly. you think for fruit trees they've always been a really good bet for me they have been for me also, uh, mind you. A lot of fruit trees are grafted onto uh, dwarfing rootstock, and there's maintenance on it because uh, if it branches out below the graft union, you will get a tree that resembles more of a bush, and these uh, these uh, suckers on it will take over the tree basically. So you have to be aware that you have to remove these suckers as close to the roots as you can. And uh, some of them, regardless if they're on a dwarfing rootstock or whatever in our climate will grow quite large. So again, keep that in mind. It's about knowing uh, what diseases are endemic to your area uh, and knowing if there's any 
plants in your yard that will be a harbor or host to a disease of a fruit tree, right? So you may have something that will harbor the, the disease or the bacteria or whatever, but won't kill it. But if you have a fruit tree in the vicinity, will actually infect the tree itself. And black knot is very difficult to get rid of. I don't think you really ever get rid of it. You just have to cut it out every time you see it. And I, I don't know if people know what black rot is, or uh, black knot is. If you look it up on the internet, you will see it's like a, a knot, a black knot uh, on the tree. And in uh, our climate in the spring, and our spring is fairly early, like normally February or so, this black knot will become white and those are the spores that are gonna disperse and create more issues on the tree itself. So a good idea is to remove these prior uh, in, the, in the fall when you see them and the trees are all off the leaves, take it and burn them. Don't put them in your compost. Uh, if you put them uh, into a landfill, make sure they're bagged so that uh, it doesn't escape. And like I said, uh, or burn them in an open fire. That way you can it's, make sure that you don't. And, and some, uh, some uh, plum cultivars um, are, are quite resistant. Yes. Uh, and many, uh, many plum cultivars um, will do just fine with black knot on them. Others will succumb. And it depends on the vigor of the individual tree as well, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. That now, someone, sure. uh, who is it? Paula wanted to know, um, she'd been seeing the, uh, the watering bags around the base of the tree. And I those... had any experience. What about you? I have seen them in Parksville. They're using them to make sure that newly planted trees uh, receive the, uh, the water that they need. Mind you, they have to go around and fill these bags all the time. They're actually uh, like, I guess there's pinholes in them. So they just slowly uh, release the water to the ground. So they're, so, they're, so they're basically a drip. They're a drip system, basically, yes. But uh, again, you still have to fill them up. I don't know how long the water lasts in them. But uh, yeah, if you uh, are away on holidays or something and you don't have somebody to watch your newly planted trees, then perhaps buying one of these might be a good idea. That way the person doesn't have to come every day and water the trees. They can actually uh, maybe fill up the bag two or three times a week. Right now, my garden is all in pots, all 100 pots. And it takes me two hours to water daily. <laughs> I can't wait for my new garden. <laughs> well, and of course, that's a that's a good uh, comment too, Richard, because um, there are there are many people who love to have a tree and love to have the privacy, um, but don't have a lot of room. And I myself on my patio, uh, uh, which was surrounded not only the patio with cement, but surrounded by driveways from my neighbors. And I had a beautiful suja hedge that was all 20 gallon pots. And um, it has lived very happily at six feet tall, all eight trees um, side by side. And all I've done is root prune them every three years. And uh, so, them, so having, and you know, dwarf, uh, yeah, dwarfing a larger tree and controlling invasive roots by by having them in large planters is an option um, for people with small gardens. And root pruning in a pot is just as easy as pie. It's not a complex thing at all. And oh. my trees have survived the drought, um, the root pruning, the tight spaces, and they're extremely healthy. So um, yeah, like yeah. you say, it takes two hours to water the little the little nutters, but uh, yeah, well, it is a, a good option. Well, it's a good option, and for me, it was the only option I had. Uh, we mm -hmm. we moved out of our home uh, in April. I've been potting up all these rotos and everything else that I wanted to take with me, 
And uh, like I said, the lot is uh, just breaking ground this coming week. And I look forward to being able to put these uh, trees and plants in the ground. Now, uh, just getting back to the uh, presentations, I was to do a presentation on small gardening, small gardens. And uh, unfortunately, that presentation is going to have to be uh, postponed till next spring because I have a garden to do it. <laughs> it's going to be a more of a video type link and uh growing plants in pots is very it's beautiful because you can provide yourself with a little bit of uh especially if you're on a patio or something you give yourself some uh privacy right exactly oh or yeah like yourself. And, yeah and uh with the you can always you can always bonsai something you oh, yeah. know <laughs> that's essentially what you're doing and you can True have enough. that you can have that gorgeous tree that is totally unsuitable. You just make it miniature. Right. My brain fart earlier, Larks, um, Texas is uh, <laughs> it's a yew tree. Yes. <laughs> we had three or four people yelling at you. It's a you, it's a you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> My mind's elsewhere sometimes. It's the gray hair. I swear it's a gray hair. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, now, um, our final question, um, uh, uh, Karen was interested in uh, suggestions for uh, tall columnar trees. Um, and she says, ginkgo, katsura, juniper, um, she's having trouble finding options. Um, now, does as she you want say- something evergreen or does she want something deciduous? Um, well, she gave us a little bit of both, didn't she? Yeah. Um, and uh, um, um, I, I, I quickly looked at a few sites, um, but I think you covered most of the the, the workable columnar trees. Right. Uh, Magnolia caperis, beautiful, evergreen, lovely, uh, shows very well. It's got a, a fawn colored. Uh, sort of fuzz on the bottom of the leaf. Uh, beautiful flowers, very, very fragrant and uh, is very calm there. It doesn't grow much more than 10 feet wide, but grows up to about 20 feet tall. And that's after about 25 years. So, and it can be fast growing here in the island. Uh, as far as other trees, if, uh, if deer resistance is a good idea, then, I did mention the two pines that were, would be quite uh, narrow and fastigate. Uh, there's also spruce. I mentioned two, Montrose Charm, which is uh, sort of a glaucous needle on it. Very pretty tree and uh, grows tall and narrow. And there's a couple of elms and there's uh, beaches that grow uh, tall and narrow and have a lovely uh, summer and fall color. Well, I think that that covers all our questions. Does anyone else have uh, another comment or question for Richard before we book off into the uh, beautiful evening? I hear it's very hot on the island. Oh, oh, ouch. It's uh, it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And. Uh, um, oh, from Kelly to everyone. It, I yeah. do. It's in the Q&A section. Kelly, did we not answer your question? Then um, I just keep typing it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe just while we're waiting for that, I'll just mention the next event uh, we're planning for Monday, September 11th, uh, next month, um, which is Shade Loving Perennial Crops. Um, so make sure to register for that one uh, coming up next month. Good. Um, it's in the Q&A section. Okay. 
Well, I think we answered all of them. Um, rootstock on Camperdown Elms. Oh, there's one more in the Q&A now. Oh, is there? Okay. Oh, five fragrant rotos. Oh, oh. yes. <laughs> <laughs> These are my favorites. There we go. <laughs> uh, polar bear, rhododendron polar bear, which uh, grows into a small tree. Fast growing, grows about uh, 12 inches a year. Uh, doesn't flower until probably it's about maybe five, six years old. So it does take a while to flower. Uh, rhododendron fortunii, fortunii. It is, uh, again, a tree-shaped roto, fragrant uh, white with a pink interior flower. So fragrant. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And you can choose rotos that don't always flower at the same time. You can uh, space out the flowering with choosing different ones. Now, uh, there's um, Roto Point Race, which is uh, a lovely Roto. Uh, the new growth is a purplish color. The stem on the new growth is a purplish color. Again, a uh, pinkish flower, very, very fragrant. Also, uh, Rhododendron Qualicum Pride, beautiful Roto, named after Qualicum Beach. And again, it's uh, more of a sh shrub, a large shrub can be, but again, a uh, pink flower, the fragrance is just to die for. Now, some of the smaller ones, uh, well, no, actually some of the larger ones are Loderized King George, which grows into a tree. Uh, white, pure white flowers, fragrant also. Uh, Loderized Venus, Another roto that actually grows quite large and is fragrant. There's a few smaller ones too. There's uh, rhododendron um, Lady Alice Fitzwilliam, which needs a protected site. So a protected site would be northeast face in a corner. I had one up by the door, uh, the front door of our house and produced uh, flowers, lovely flowers, and again, very fragrant. Uh, there's another one, uh, Rhododendron Countess of Haddington, which is also fragrant. Uh, more of a shrub than a tree, can be a little uh, lanky. So again, that's one that you would want to pinch and uh, tip pinch and get it to push out a little bit. So there are a fair amount of uh, smellies, as I call them, <laughs> my favorite rotos. <laughs> Everything in my yard has to have a fragrance. If it doesn't have a fragrance, it's got to have something that brings interest to the yard. It's about painting, not only with your vision, but with your, your nose. So you walk by something and the fragrance just whiffs. It invites people into your house and invites people into your yard. And, you know, people will walk by and, what's that smell? You know, and that some people have knocked on my door and say, there's an incredible smell coming from your yard. And I say, oh, it's that tree right there. So that, I that's plant quite true stuff for fragrance. That's quite true. And people, people forget. How uh, how important how important that is in in uh, keeping the spirit peaceful, uh, keeping the spirit peaceful, and you don't want something that uh, is overwhelming, but you want something that sort of is pleasant to the eye, right? And like if you plant something, plant something that doesn't all flower at the same time, because you could have a roto garden and they all flower in May, and then there's nothing throughout the year, right? So look at your rotos or trees or whatever and try to plant it so you've got something flowering at all times of the year or something that smells all times of the year. Like there's some uh, Saracoco, which is quite a fragrant 
low growing, you can plant it up by a door. It can be a little invasive because it does spread, but if it's contained, again, beautiful smell, skimia. Flowers in the early spring when there's nothing else that's flowering and it has a beautiful fragrance. You know, get a male and more fragrant, get the female less fragrant, but you've got red berries in the, the fall. And I think with I think with many of the small uh, trees in the garden, um, people do forget to combine things like winter interest and um, I know even with some of the big rotos that you were you were saying well, they get quite rangy, and yet in winter with the snow on the leaves, that so that cool. gnarly that gnarly rangy bark underneath them has such a shape. And then the chickadees come and sit in there and um, there's so much more than just the blossoms and just the fragrance. And if From you're going to be roads? picking, if you're going to be picking trees, take some time with it. Take, exactly. you, know. you don't have to plant everything all the time. First thing, do a site plan and then go from there. That's the most important part I can tell anybody is get a site plan. Because as a uh, gardener, I learned my lesson. <laughs> yes. I overplanted, but the thing is, I overplanted, but I chose the things that were slower growing as being the root of the, the base of the yard, right? The, and the, the, the other bones, things yeah. I could cut out and still have the bones there. And then you work to the bones, you get down to the bushes, you get down to the ground covers, the perennials. So you've got a, a layer of plants, so you don't have any bare ground. And I think that's something that a lot of people forget, um, particularly, um, I mean, so many folks uh, tonight were from basically mild areas, um, or to put it a better way, areas with a very long growing season. And so things do grow faster, larger, um, and they sometimes grow themselves to death. And I'm right. sure you've had this too, Richard, because you, like, like me, have lived in many places. And um, people will say to me, I have said to me over the years, wow, you did such wonderful things to your garden. It's looking lovely. And yet all I did was take out 50% of all the overgrown, badly pruned trees that someone else and, and shrubs that someone else had put in. And then suddenly you could see what was in the garden. And yet if they had just taken that time, as, as you've been telling us, take plan, the time, plan, know plan. what you want, um, plan for the, the feature to be in a different season um, and um, enjoy a garden that you're not is is not going to work you to death in ten years. Well, exactly, and that's one of the reasons why we sold our old property and bought a very small lot. And uh, the thank two, you so much, Richard. We're, sorry, we're just running okay, a bit no over time, so I don't want to cut you off. But um, <laughs> on, anyway. um, so thank you so much for a great presentation, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and as I said, we'll be sending out the link to the recording. So if you want to watch again or missed any information, um, you can watch it again. So look for that um, in the next few days or the next week. Okay, um, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Just a uh, final word. Plan, plan, plan. Enjoy your green children. <laughs> <laughs> and take care of them, nurture them. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, and thanks, Joe. Joe. Bye, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>